It's hot, man. I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, it is hot out. Yeah. All right. On the Roadie Runback podcast, I welcome on Coach Phil Martelli Jr. He is the assistant coach of Bryant. Coach, how are you today? I'm great, Jeff. How about yourself? I'm doing great. Coach, I want to say thank you for making the time to come on the show. How are you, how are you holding up during these times right now? You know, I've been okay. Uh, I got three small children, a 10 and eight and a two year old. So we survived uh, virtual learning with two of the three and <laughs> the little guy, he just ran around like a madman. Luckily it's gotten nice and they've been able to get outside a little bit. So it hasn't helped my hairline. I've, you know, my hair is all gone, but <laughs> at least my sanity's back a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's the, that's the uh, most important thing is the sanity's back and the school school year is over with, so hopefully we don't have to do too many too much more virtual learning. Hopefully we get back to the school system eventually, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, coach, how how are you like? How do you like Rhode Island? Like, how, how long you been here in Rhode Island for? So I've been here just over two years. I got here uh, in April of 2018, so just over two years. My family moved up in August of that year, um, and it's funny. Last night, me and my wife were having we went and found a place. Uh, in Warren, uh, out on the water, and we got a lobster roll. I'd been dying for a lobster roll. I hadn't had one all summer. <laughs> so her and I went, and uh, we were sitting out there, and she's from Connecticut, so she's a New England girl, but she said, she was like, it was such a nice night. She's like, you know what? I just really love that we live here, and it it really is like a, it's just such a nice place, and and for me to leave Philadelphia was a big deal, to leave that area and my whole family. Yeah. Um, and to be somewhat close to my in-laws is great, you know, even though we're still about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes from them. Yeah. But to come to Rhode Island, the people are unbelievable. And, you know, the places we've been and the, the weather and everything, uh, you know, we, had, we couldn't ask for much more. And, and luckily, our kids have adjusted well and have found some really great friends at a great school. And uh, it's made Rhode Island a, a really great place for this Martelli family. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's a nice state to be in. Um, it's easy to drive from one end to the other. It takes forty five <laughs> minutes. Yeah, <laughs> if you're a typical Rhode Islander, people usually like you have to pack a lunch or a drink because it's like a long drive. But yeah, exactly. And it's nice. <laughs> but it's nice. You're you're probably in a good area where you can go to Boston or yep. you know nothing's too far away. Uh, yeah, it's it's a nice area. Have you experienced any good Italian food around here yet? Some pretty good ones. Uh, we're, we're living in Cranston, so we're right in that Knightsville section. So there's a whole bunch of places right there that uh, we haven't gotten to all of them, but we've gotten to several of them. And, uh, you know, we've been down to, to Federal Hill a little bit and uh, been to one or two of those places and a couple of pizza places. So we don't get out for anything fancy with the three kids and, yeah. and limited babysitting. But, uh, you know, whenever we can, we try to experience something new. And that was actually good during the quarantine. We tried to get out and you know, we were a typical Italian family. We do pizza on Friday nights. So yeah. we tried to get out and just go like, all right, we've, we've been to this place. We've been to that place. Let's try to fly, drive. You know, we'll go even if it's a half hour, put everybody in the car. Yeah. So we're able to experience a little something different there too. Yeah, yeah. How's it compared to Philadelphia? Food. You know, pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. You know, the Italians roll thick. So anytime, you know, as we moved into our neighborhood the first time, our neighbor, her dad was, was picking her up and he, he said, what's your name? I said, Martelli. He said, with an I? I said, yeah, because... You'll be all set in this neighborhood. Just go up the street. Any of those places will be good to you. So, yeah, have, <laughs> gotta have that connection. Have you had soupy yet with the Rhode Island famous soupy? No, we have not. All right, I'll, I have to send you some, Coach, because uh, okay. we we make it. So homemade secure sausage. If you like cured sausage, I have to send you some. Okay, yeah, we're and in. We're in. It's some good stuff. <laughs> I'll send it with that shirt. <laughs> I'll send it with that shirt. But I want to start off, Coach. I want to get into your, uh, you know, your basketball and your coaching background. Um, so your your father is very he's a legendary coach, uh, Phil Martelli, senior coach of St. Joe's. You know what was like? What was the basketball culture like in your household when you were growing up? So it was it was pretty thick. Um, my dad, obviously, you mentioned, uh, played Division three at Widener University. Was the all time assist leader there. Went on obviously to have a, a long coaching career and still coaching today. My mom played at Immaculata College in the early 70s and she was actually part of uh, three national championship teams and my parents met working a basketball camp which coincidentally I met my wife Megan working a basketball camp oh my God. Uh, so so it was always part of our family and it's funny because that's transitioned today with my kids my like I said my wife played she actually lost in the national championship game playing at Eastern Connecticut Oh, wow. uh, back in 2003 but her dad's a high school coach in Connecticut her brother 
has been an AAU high school and is now Division II assistant. My brother is an assistant, uh, assistant director of operations at VCU. So we just grew up with it all the time. I mean, my earliest memories are going and, you know, meeting my dad's team at Bishop Kenrick when I was probably three years old. And the funny story is I, the first time I went out to half court to meet his team and I wet my pants, I was so nervous. So <laughs> luckily that doesn't happen anymore. I don't get to practice at Brian wet my pants anymore, but uh, you know, that, that's just, those are the memories, you know, like all of our family trips and, and things like that were, you know, driving up to see St. Joe's play UMass and going to the basketball hall of fame or, you know, going to this place or that place, going to, to California to see St. Joe's play Loyola Marymount when they have Bo Kimball and Hank Gather. So that's what my childhood was. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, you know, luckily my kids have kind of bought into that uh, as well. And, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't forced upon me. It hasn't been forced upon them, but it's a beautiful thing when they enjoy what you're doing. And, and for me, having grown up that way, I, I can see it through their eyes too. That's going to be a joy to grow up around. Oh, no, no. Does your, now how's your kids met your basketball team? And do they, none of them uh, have repeated, yeah, none of them repeated you? Time. Yeah. yeah the, my son, Philip is, is 10, almost 11. And, uh, you know, he's, He's the one I wouldn't know. I don't know if you would remember this, but years ago when they filmed uh, my dad and his grandson was dressed up as him and mimicking him on the side. Oh, yeah. 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 My son Philip, who's now oh, an 11 year old going on uh, 22, I think. But, <laughs> um, you know, he he's so into it. He loves being in the locker room and talking trash with the guy. And, <laughs> and it's fun. It's just a lot of fun. I love it. I love having him around and, um, you know, my whole family around at the games and things like that. Because, again, that's how I grew up. And. You know, I love the way I grew up. So to see them grow up that way and be excited about it. And our two-year-old Nate, all he wants to do is shoot the ball, shoot the ball, shoot the ball. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a cool thing. That, that is really cool. And, like, is there an, a certain age that you started picking up, like, playing basketball and started taking it more serious? Or? Um, I, I mean, we started pretty early. My earliest memories, we had a blue chair at our house, like a blue lounge chair, and that's where we learned to shoot. My dad would – you know, a little like Fisher Price ball. And we just shoot on that. We were better to be two, three years old. And then, you know, eventually we got like a little Fisher Price hoop and we'd set that up and we'd play, uh, you know, me and my brother, my brother's only a year younger. So we play two on one versus my dad. And um, so those are my earliest, like just basketball memories. Yeah. Uh, as far as organized, uh, it was somewhere probably around maybe kindergarten, first, second grade, somewhere in that range, like starting to play in, just local youth leagues. Um, and then, you know, probably got really serious. I always loved it, but got really serious with it, you know, like fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, playing CYO down in Philadelphia and being on some good teams there and uh, just kind of falling in love with it. You know, I played baseball and soccer and football growing up. But at that time, that's when I kind of noticed, you know what, I, those are okay. I like playing those, but I do love playing basketball. I love being around the game. And that, that's what kind of drew me to it. That's awesome. And what's, what's like basketball? What's it like playing in basketball in Philadelphia? Like what's the level of competition down there? Like, you know, it's, it's pretty high. Um, and we grew up just outside the city in Drexel Hill, Delaware County, which highly populated area at that time, you know, growing up going to Catholic school, CYO was like the thing, like you couldn't wait to get the fifth grade so you could be on the CYO. Team. Yeah, yeah. And you know, all the schools were packed. So we had, we had rivals that, uh, we probably had four or five schools of kids that I grew up playing, you know, Little League baseball with and, and travel basketball and things like that. So, you know, even at that age, like you felt a rivalry, you know, you knew like at St. Bernadette's walking into St. Dots or St. Mary Magdalene, you're like, all right, like this is a big game. Like this means something to us. Um, you know, so doing that and then growing up, going into high school, going to St. Joe's Prep, playing in the Philadelphia Catholic League, which is one of the prestigious high school leagues in the country playing in the Sunny Hill League, which was a big summer league in the city at that time. They played at the games at Temple University. So, you know, walking in there to play in the games and, you know, you'd have all of, of Philadelphia there, you know, all the different neighborhoods and uh, the different sections of the city kind of there to, to represent. And, you know, that was the place to be on a, you know, a, a Thursday night or a Friday night in July, you know, or June. You just, yeah. you were walking in the Sunny Hill League and, you know, you better be ready to go. And, you know, I love that. I, I think about those times all the time. They were probably, as a player, they're probably some of my my fondest memories, you know, doing those things. That's really cool. That's got to be like a cool feeling, especially on the summer, playing in June and just like walking into that environment and just like playing and playing basketball. Like it's almost like the regular season. No doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no <laughs> doubt. 
Was that now? What was your recruiting process like? Did you always know that you were going to play for your dad at St. Joe's, or was there like a school on the cusp that you thought you might? No, play? I knew I wanted to go to St. Joe's. Uh, I mean, I was not a very good player. You know, I wasn't somebody that people were going to bang down their door for. But I knew early on that I wanted to go and play at St. Joe's. Now, my brother, a year later, he knew he wanted to play. Like I was good being a walk on. I knew yeah. I wanted to coach. Probably when I was in like seventh, eighth grade, I realized. Not a whole lot of 5'11 unathletic white guys in the NBA. So that <laughs> that dream was starting to fade a little bit. But I knew I wanted to be around the game. I knew I wanted to coach. And I thought at that time, who better to learn from than my father? You know, somebody that I have the ultimate respect for and have watched so closely. Um, and a place that I loved, you know, at the time. So I wanted to be on that team. I wanted to be on that campus. You know, I just wanted to be a part of that. And fortunately for me, I was really lucky that I had great teammates that allowed me to be that they didn't look at me as coach's son you know I was still I was number 10 I was I was just another guy in the locker room so there were plenty of days where we walk in there and you know they're they're coach this and coach that and I'm sitting there saying yeah coach this and coach that you know and and it wasn't me running back on hey do you won't believe what so-and-so said so um you know so for me that's what I wanted to do you know, now, like I was saying, my brother, a year younger, he wanted to play. He knew he couldn't go be a walk-on and just be a practice guy. So, you know, he went and wanted to play Division Three, and that's what he did. That's, uh, that's awesome. But yeah. how was it like learning from your dad? Like, I mean, your dad is like, you know, this prestigious coach played at St. Joe's, definitely legendary. Like, every time you think of St. Joe's, you can't help but think about your dad. So what's it like, you know, learning from one of the best that's out there? It was uh, really eye-opening. I was lucky, again, I had great teammates, and that was the first and foremost thing, that, that those guys embraced me. Um, the second piece was he treated me like everybody else. You know, when I was on the court, I was number 10. I wasn't his son. I wasn't Philip. I wasn't Phil Jr. You know, I, I was just like everybody else. Yeah. And, I mean, the great thing about him is that he treats – a lot of coaches talk about, like, I treat all these players like my family. I treat them all like my son. Yeah. And he really does genuinely do that. You know, and and so that made it easy. You know, like he could treat me the same way he was going to treat Mike Farrelly or Naeem Crenshaw or Marvin O'Connor or Jameer Nelson. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, go up and down the list. Like we were all the same, you know, and, and we were treated well. We were treated the right way. Now, when I did something wrong, I got – I heard it. You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. When I did something right, I got patted on the back for it. Yeah. And that's all I ever wanted. You know, I just wanted to be treated like one of the guys and, you know, try to get, try to get better and try to keep expanding my game and help the team however I could. For me, that was practice. And luckily I was on some good teams. So we were up big a lot and I was able to get in, in some games. My first college basket was at Keeney gym. Or was it really? <laughs> yeah. We were playing Rhode Island. It was when they, they'd just come off Lamar Odom years and they were really down and we were yeah. very good. Um, and we were up big and, uh, Zach Marbury, Steph's little brother, was was there. He was guarding me, yep. and they were pressing us or something. And somehow the ball went long, and I got it and made my left-handed layup. And that was my first <laughs> first two of my first of my career eight points. So that was uh, <laughs> that's it's, it's that's, easy to remember all the baskets when you only made four of them. So. <laughs> that's awesome, though. I happened at Keeney, like right yeah, here. I'm at so I have a very fond. Anytime I'm on Rhode Island campus, I have very fond memories of. Of being there it's still there it's still in the back it over there. i don't know if you've yeah. seen it at the ryan center but it's like over in the back over there yeah. mm-hmm. been able to sneak on and play on there a couple of times but <laughs> yeah, it's <pretty> <laughs> that's awesome um so did you know like that team that you before you graduate you graduated in 2003 that 04 team with jameer and delante west did you know they were gonna have that amazing run i mean not to that extent yeah i, I mean i knew they'd be pretty good we were pretty good my senior year we had a really good team uh, Jameer was the junior. Delante was a sophomore. Pat Carroll was a sophomore. Would go on to be a ten player of the year. Uh, we had we had a really good team, kind of out of nowhere. Yeah. We opened up that year at Boston College, who was like preseason top twenty. They had Troy Bell and Ryan Sydney and yeah. Craig Smith was a freshman. Um, and we went up there and we we had lost a lot the year before. We were supposed to be my junior year. We were preseason top ten in the country. Wow. We'd gone to the second round of the NCAA tournament as a sophomore. We had everybody back. And it just was one of those teams that just never clicked. We still won 19 games. Yeah, yeah. We ended up going to the NIT. I think we won the regular season in the A-10, but we had a, we had a poor non-conference. We, 
we lost our opener out in California. We lost to Eastern Washington in the tournament, like got upset, should have never lost. And yeah. we just never, it was just one of those things that just never kind of clicked. My senior year, we were very new. Delante had not played much as a freshman. Pat Carroll hadn't played at all. Those guys ended up being superstars. And we were a very, very cohesive unit. Like that team was super close. And really the only thing, we ended up being a seven seed in the NSA tournament. We lost to Auburn in overtime. Oh, wow. And the one thing that held us back is Delante sprained his ankle turn, towards the end of the year. Yeah. And he, played the, he played probably the last seven or eight games. And he was probably about 60%, maybe even 50%. And that slowed us down big time. And he been had he been healthy, that team would have probably made a run, a sweet 16-like run. Oh, wow. So I knew there was something special with that group coming back. Yeah. Uh, and then I remember that summer when Jameer had tested the waters and when he finally declared or, you know, finally decided he was coming back to school. I remember being – we were working. We had camp going on, basketball camp. And I remember being in the office. And you could just feel like – it just was something magical. You just knew like something was about to pop. And the really the funny story about that is there's two funny stories to that. That year before my senior year, we started off the year, we were like seven and oh, something like that. Right after Christmas, we were going out to play Pacific in California. And then we were playing Gonzaga on New Year's Eve. It was really good. They had really good teams. And um, we had battled them the year before on New Year's Eve. They beat us, Dan Dickow, if you remember Dan Dickow. Yep, yep, yep. had a crazy shot to beat us at at, uh, at the field house at St. Joe's. So we were returning that game. Yeah. So we're 7-0. and We go out to the Pacific, and we lost. And my mom tells the story. She was sitting there with a couple of the other coaches' wives, and they're kind of dejected. You know, we're 7-0, and and you're feeling good, and you lose yeah. a game. And now you're going to play Gonzaga, who's very, very good. And and this guy's walking up the steps and goes, ah, cheer up. It's not like you were going to win them all. Wow. And then a year later, they went and won them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the other story to that is, uh, you know, and this is St. Joe's. Like, this, at that time, you're going, like, this is – my dad had taken a team to the Sweet 16, but that seemed like that would never happen. You know, I was once in a lifetime. Like, you're never going to see that again, not at a place like St. Joe's. So we were getting ready to play Temple, and we had had a bad practice. And we went back to St. Joe's. We were having watching film. And I remember Delante, we were all kind of talking. Me and Jameer were the captain. So we're kind of talking, like, we got to get our stuff together. Like, we're playing too well to let this happen, to have a bad day like this. And Delante speaks up and goes, look, man, I'm trying to go to the Final Four. And I remember thinking at that time, like, man, this dude is, like, how can he think like that? Yeah. And, again, sure enough, I mean, they were a fingernail away from going to the Final Four at a, at a place like St. Joe's, a rinky-dink place like St. Joe's that – is more like Bryant than it is like Kansas or Duke, you yeah. know, and Those and schools. to be able to do that and have that chance. But, you know, when you have guys like that that have that vision and have that competitive drive and weren't going to be stopped like him and Jameer and a lot of the other guys, you know, it ends up being something magical. So I knew something special would happen, but I, I never would have predicted, you know, the way it did. Yeah, were you like, damn, did I miss out? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was my first year in coaching. I was at Central Connecticut. Oh, really? Okay. And I, I'd say this all the time. Like, this is before internet and before live streams and all those things and Twitter and all that. Like, so if the game wasn't on TV, like, there was no really near, no real way to follow it other than they used to have a, a phone line at Press Row. Yeah, yeah. So I had the phone number and I'd dial the phone number and I'd call and say, can I get an update? And they'd say with 1555 left in the second half, you know, St. Joe's 48, Rhode Island 40. Yeah. And that's how you get this. That's how I'd follow the game. Yeah. Well, once it kind of hit a certain point, it blew up. And now all of a sudden, like the Hartford current, there's big articles. ESPN's doing a story on them, you know, maybe not every night, but most nights you can watch all the highlights, things like that. So I remember feeling like, all right, I'm not that removed from it. Yeah. Um, you know, where, where I can't really follow what's going on. Now, have, if I were in Philadelphia or had been on the team at the time, I, there's no way, you know, that, that magnitude I wouldn't have been able to fathom. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was crazy. I remember, like, watching them play and, like, seeing this, like, this team come out of the – like, St. Joe's come out of the blue and be, like, this amazing team. And I remember you guys have made it. And then I'll never forget, I wanted to go to the game. It was you or I versus St. Joe's, the last game of the, like, yep, regular yep. season. And I – you or I almost had won, but I was yeah, like, did, yeah. I was like, very, I was so mad. I had to be 
at some like some event or something like that but i was like trying to like talk my parents into like let's just buy tickets like, yeah. like they'll, they'll forgive us if we go to the game because i just remember it was just like so much hype of them coming into it but yeah. it was crazy to watch those that team and what jameer and delante were able to do and um you know, and just that amazing run that they were able to have. Yeah, they, were, they were special guys. And the other guys on that team, I mentioned Pat Carroll. Yeah. Um, Dwayne Jones, who had a, a, a little bit of time in the NBA, was our center. John Bryant, who's coaching for the Sixers now, uh, was like the ultimate utility man. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. Chet Stachitis came off the bench, was a great player. Dave Mallon was a great player. I mean, it, this, it's amazing when you look back and go the number of just really good players. Obviously, Jameer and Delante got all the attention. Yeah. Rightfully so. Um, but the everybody knew where they fit. You know, like it, it, like I mentioned that team my junior year, we kind of had some like, well, I'm the man. No, I'm the man. Yeah. I see the man. And, you know, there was a little of that where that team, it just was like, this is where you fit. This is where you fit. This is where you fit. And everybody was just good. And it, and it is. It's one of those kind of once in a lifetime where all the pieces just fit together perfectly. You know, and unfortunately, the luck of the game – you know, comes into play in a, a fingernail away. And John Lucas, yep. you know, it was, Pat Carroll almost deflected the ball. If he deflects that ball, the game's over. Instead, it goes right past his finger. And John Lucas picks the ball up and keys in the shot. And, you know, it's, it's you get a rush shot at the end and it's it's over. But, yeah, the memories of that will, will never end. That's, that's awesome. And you had mentioned that you were coaching at Central Connecticut State. What was that transition like from going – from being a player, a captain – your senior year to going into that coaching position? It was hard, a lot harder than I anticipated. When you're a player, you think you know, like you think you're there all the time and working hard, and then you get to be a coach, and you're like, wait a second, like I'm in at, you know, 7.45, 8 o'clock, and I'm working, and then we have practice at 2, and then they're lifting, and then I got to go do some film, and you're like, man, like now you're leaving at 8 o'clock, and you're like, that's a 12-hour day. That So you don't – I wasn't – I mean, I knew how to work and I knew how to work hard. Yeah. But I, I was just saying this to somebody else, a friend of mine. We were talking about this exact thing. And, I, you know, there's no manual for it. So you kind of get there and all of a sudden you're just thrown into it the first day and you got to figure it out. Yeah. And the hard thing for me sometimes was I felt like because I had been around it and grown up around it, people just assumed rather than like maybe grab you by the hand and be like, okay, here's what you're going to do today or here. Yeah. So I had to learn quick. Uh, and I think I did do that, and I, I think I did a good job. But it was. It was an adjustment. And and there's just a different – I think every coach would tell you this. They would trade anything to be a player again. Yeah, yeah. You know, where at the time, players probably looked at you and be like, man, I want to be a coach. You know, like, yeah. I'd, rather, I'd rather coach. Yeah. But you do, like, that competitive juice and just the, the chance to get out there and play. And even now, i would be 39 next week. Like, even at 39, you, you get out there and just to do a walkthrough, you know, the day before a game and just – run the point for the walkthrough team, just literally walking through. Yeah. And two or three plays in, you start to get a little of that, like, all right, like, <laughs> why don't we, like, go through full speed one time and see it now. Now, yeah. when we do that and I realize, like, okay, I can't move anymore. <laughs> I was pretty slow to begin with, and now I'm super slow. Yeah. <laughs> then you don't get that fire anymore, but but you do. Like, you, you miss it, so. Yeah. So that was hard. It was very different. And I was I was in a very different place. You know, it was, it was a very different style uh, Howie Dickman, who was the legendary coach there, who I worked for, his style was so different than my dad. So that adjustment of going like, all right, this is totally a different environment and yeah. trying to get that lay of the land and get used to that. So, you know, it, it was an adjustment for sure, but uh, I'm really fortunate. I'm fortunate that I worked for him right away because I learned so much about him, about, about his program, about, you know, the way he ran his program, about myself, just things like that, that, uh, I'm really fortunate that that I got that opportunity early on. Now, what's it like working for other coaches and kind of like picking up different styles and like how do you like mesh that into like your own kind of your own coaching style? Well, I think first and foremost you have to be yourself. Like yeah. You have to you have to know who you are and be comfortable with that. Like you can't fake. Like I can't go and say, all right, I'm going to be Jared Grasso today. All right, I'm going to go be Phil Martelli. All right, I'm going to go be Jared Grasso. Or I'm going to or uh, Monte Ross or or Joe Mahalik or uh, Bobby Gonzalez or Howie Dickman, any of these guys I work for, like you, I, I can't be them and I yeah. shouldn't try to be them. Um, but you also have to look and say, okay, this is what the head coach wants as an assistant and say, all right, this is, this is what he needs from me. Yeah. And as you grow in this, 
I'm not the same coach I was 10 years ago, you know, at Niagara. Yeah. And you kind of develop a style, you develop your voice, you kind of figure your role expands or maybe it shrinks depending on where you are. You know, so for me now, I feel like a true extension of Jared That's awesome. as a head coach, you know, and, and um, I think he really trusts me. I really trust him. And we have a lot of discussion that way where when you're a younger guy, maybe you're kind of more of the, Hey, make sure the guys are okay. You're coaching, but your role is maybe a little more like, all right, go put your arm around this guy. Go make sure that that guy's okay. Yeah. You, you know, go check up on them outside, go in the cafeteria and check up on them. As you get a little older in this, it's you know, maybe not as much of that piece of it, mm-hmm. uh, but there's still a blend, you know, there's still a blend of all that, but yeah, I mean, it, and every guy I've worked for has been very different. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. And they've all had success. Like they've all had success, but they've all been different. And I actually keep some notes on my phone, you know, some, some kind of coaching notes for myself that I've kept for a long time. And, you know, that's one of them that I have in there. Like what were the, the, my perceived strengths and weaknesses of each guy and things that, and then things that maybe I would take and, and quite honestly, things that I wouldn't, like I wouldn't do that. Okay. Yeah. That works for, that worked for Joe Mahalik. That doesn't work for me. You know, that worked for Monte Ross. That doesn't work for me. So it's, you know, finding those things too and, and, trying to blend it to find your own voice and your own style so that, you know, for me, the next step is hopefully to be a head coach, you know, somewhere. So trying to take those things that I've learned good, bad, and indifferent and try to figure out how I can use them. Yeah. That's amazing. That's like an amazing answer. And it's so interesting to hear guys have worked with different coaches, their perspective on those those things and things that they face and, um, you know, learning from different coaches styles, but able to stay themselves and like keep their personality, but like take their strengths or other perspectives from coaches as well. Yeah, it's, it's so true. And there, I mean, there's no, there's no cookie cutter way. And that's something I didn't necessarily realize. And after a few years being in this, like you realize, okay, there's no cookie cutter way to do this. Like there's yeah. not a, just like style of play. There's teams that play zone. There's teams that press. There's teams that, shoot a lot of threes there's teams that don't there's teams that do this there's teams that you know even in the age of analytics there's there's still teams that do it every different way not so much in the pros but in college basketball yeah you know they do it every different way so there's really no cookie cutter way so you just have to find your way you know in, in the way you're most comfortable and then and then run with it that's true that's very true i like that I like that a lot and you play you coached in the the g leagues and what was that transition like from uh you know division one and then you know, then going back into very it. Very different. Yeah, yeah, it was very different. I really, really enjoyed it. And it's one of those things I wonder, had I done it 10 years earlier, you know, when I was in my mid-20s and not my mid-30s, if it would have led to a different path? Yeah. Uh, the the positives for me at, in, at that time, it was the D-League still. It was the last year of the D-League. But in that league, the it was just basketball. And that was a beautiful thing. You know, like you're not worried about compliance. You're not worried about contacting admissions. There was no recruiting. Like it was, you were strictly like, this is our team. We had a GM who was doing personnel things. And if occasionally he'd call us and be like, hey, we can run, we, you know, we can trade for Jeff, you know, go on and watch his stuff and let me know what you think. And you watch and you go like, I think we should trade for him. Or no, I don't think we should. You know, hey, here's a free agent. or Here's a guy on the waivers. Um, so that was great. I loved the players. And I think there's a bad rep, and maybe that's changing a little bit. At that time, there was maybe a little bit of like, oh, the guy, some of the G League guys are nuts. They were great. They were professionals. They were – those guys really want to play good basketball. Yeah. They really do. Now, you have guys – everybody there is trying to get out of there. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, make no mistake about it. No one is in the G League thinking like, yes, this is my career. Players, coaches, GMs, interns, like, nobody is there thinking like, this is my lifetime. <laughs> But guys treat it like a job. And we had some older guys that I really connected with and got really close to. They were true professionals. And they love the hoop. They love to play good basketball. And they love to learn. You know, like, I mean, you'd have a guy, like we had Nate Robinson, who at that time had played, you know, won the dunk contest. And, you know, little Nate Robinson and and had played for the Celtics. And, you know, I'm having debates with him. Yeah, like he's coming to me going like, what should I do defensively here? And you're going like, you've played for Doc Rivers. Like Tom Thibodeau was your assistant coach. Like <laughs> you've played for all these guys. Like you're coming to me, you know, like you've played for Mike D'Antoni. Like you're asking me, but, but that's how they treated you. 
So I loved it from the perspective of it made me really make sure I was on my toes and really doing my homework. And it also gave me an, a confidence boost because we were coming off, you know, our staff had been fired at the University of Delaware. Oh, wow. We won a championship in 2014. My, my boss and our AD were not on good terms. There was constant friction there. It led to really a, a bad situation for everybody. And eventually they let us go. So you're coming out of that doubting yourself a little bit. Yeah. You know, like, what could I have done better? Am I not good enough? Like, all those things that creep into your head. Then I go there and I'm like, man, I'm working with pros. Like, that dude was playing, you know, Mike Scott is with us, you know, playing. He's playing for the Sixers now, but he was playing for the Atlanta Hawks. And, you know, he's had a rehab assignment with us. And you're, like, breaking down things with Mike Scott. And he's, like, asking you, like, what? And you're like, dude, like, you're making, like, $12 million a year. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, I'm making peanuts. Like, but it gave me the confidence, like, all right, yeah, you, you know what you're doing. Yeah. You know, you know what you're doing. And, you know, just because things didn't work out at Delaware and maybe you're not still headed on the same career path you thought you were, the same trajectory that you thought you were, it gave me that boost of like, all right, I, I got this. And being able to learn so much because those, at that level, that MBA level, pro level, to me, it was like a PhD. You know, if I had had a master's after whatever number of years of coaching I'd had, yeah. You know, like that was a PhD. Like I got a PhD in coaching that year. Uh, okay. You know, so, so it was different, but like, I mean, we had 31 different guys play over wow. 50 games. Holy crap. That's crazy. You no, know, I had come in from five years at Delaware. We didn't have 31 different guys at Delaware. Five years before that at Niagara, we didn't have 31 different, in five years, let alone 50 games in four or five months. So, so that was hard. And we were a little bit isolated. We didn't have an office. We weren't around people. You know, I do love it at the college level where, you know, I can walk into our compliance, you know, director's office and, and sit down and just kind of, you know, you know, shoot the breeze with him yeah. and things like that. And, you know, going down and, and talking to people and seeing that, you know, the lady that does the business stuff and asking her about her family. I, I, I like that. I like people. I like being around that. So that was the one thing for us. We went to the gym. We met, practiced. We met after practice and we were home. Oh, wow. So you didn't have that same camaraderie. Uh, now I will say a couple of the guys that I'm closest with right now are guys that were on that staff with me, you know, oh, so wow. that was a beautiful thing, but just that outside, like, all right, we're not talking about basketball. I can go down the hall and talk to somebody and, Hey, did you watch the Red Sox game? Did you see the Phillies game? Did you watch this show? Did you, you know, whatever it is. And just, I like that. I like being able to have that kind of normalcy in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Have, it's like almost being like in that office setting and being able to have a conversation with someone and not, you know, it's all work and business. And then you just leave after that. No doubt. No doubt. That's tough. But yeah, I've heard a lot about like the G league players. Those guys are hard workers. Like even just like on, from speaking to them with, on my other podcast, those guys, like they, they work so hard and they're just so motivated and they're so positive too. Some of the guys I've spoken to are just like the most positive dudes I've ever talked to in my life. It's like, man, like you've been going through some stints for your life, but you're able just to keep, keep stay positive through all this like things and just want to make achieve that goal it's like yeah, it's crazy no yeah there's no doubt but how did so you made the transition back to the d1 and like how did you get started at bryant so uh i was actually at the final four and got word that jared was getting the job and uh so jared and i started together in the business we started you know back in college we start working camps and uh, bouncing around and going to college camps and working their camps. And then some of the big recruiting camps, uh, you know, we just started kind of working camps together and, and connected and became close and have stayed close ever since. So we've talked about it before. There were other jobs that were open that he was involved with that he'd say, you know, if I get this, would you come? Things like that. So uh, he got the job and called me and said, I want you to come. And I believe a thousand percent in him I always have and I told him I said I just want to come up and see it I just need to see that the place is right and yeah. you know especially for me with at that time you know my two my two oldest were uh eight and six and the baby had just been born he was only about a month and a half old oh, wow. so you know to make that to make that move and to leave my family and my whole support system down there you know with my parents and sister and a ton of aunts, uncles, and cousins, and all that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was going to have to be the right situation. But for him and 
com- coming up to Bryant, seeing what what's capable here, and getting that feel and saying this this place is right. Like this is a place that I fit. Uh, it just made it all, you know, made it all come together. That's awesome. That's well, we're glad to have you um, in Rhode Island and yeah, I love be, part it. The, be part of the Bryant squad. And you know, hopefully, good things. Bryant's up there with like you know just making runs and tournaments and stuff like that. It'd be awesome. Um, yeah, that's the plan. I mean, we're trying to turn. You know, we've turned it pretty good. You know, they'd won three games the year before we got here. We won 10 the first year and 15 last year. So we're the only team in the country that has quintupled their win total in two years. So That's awesome. That's crazy, too. <laughs> Especially when you can come up with a big word like quintuple. You know, you always got to use that somehow. So. <laughs> Put that, like, on your resume. I quintupled. That's, it. That's <laughs> it. It's on there. Trust me, it's on there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, last season, like, unfortunately was cut short like what's that feeling like of having that season cut and like what do you think that you guys could have done if it wasn't so we had just finished we lost um the week before everything got shut down we lost at st francis pa in our conference tournament yeah so we were done the teams that were that had won championships my my best friend in the world uh, mike farrelly was a walk-on with me at st joe's He's an assistant at Hofstra. I mean, they won their championship on a Monday or Tuesday night, and two days later, the NCAA tournament got canceled. Like, that that blow, I can't even – you know, in our league, Robert Morris had won it, and it gets canceled. Yeah. So that's a little bit different feeling probably for them. You know, our season was over. The, the, the weirdness for us is that I haven't seen any of our guys since March 6th, somewhere around that. So it's July 22nd today. So, you know, you're talking about almost five months. And by the time they get here, it'll be almost five and a half months before you see any of your guys. So that, that is a very weird thing. Typically right now we'd be towards the end of our summer workouts. You know, they would have been here for five, six, seven weeks by now. Um, So that is a really weird feeling, you know, and trying to figure out when they come back, like how do we get started back up? Yeah. You know, and, with the uncertainty of, is the season going to start November 10th? Is it going to get pushed back? Is it going to get rearranged? And so that's really hard because we've agonized over it. And then we get to a point where like, it's not even worth agonizing over anymore because we can't control it. Yeah. So we just got to go with the punches. And I keep my, my line right now is like, I'm going on business as usual until it's not usual anymore. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and trying to finish need one more game on the schedule need, you know, luckily we finished recruiting pretty quick uh, with some transfers doing Zoom calls and things like that. So that ended, you know, probably in the middle of the spring, which was good. <clears throat> but, yeah, I mean, in terms of, like, what do you do with them? And even now, like, we're trying to do a Zoom call or two a week with everybody just to see everybody's face. And we've had some great guest speakers come on. And tomorrow we'll do kind of a get-to-know-you little session, fun little session, just as something different. And, so it's just been trying to reinvent yourself that way. And I think the biggest thing for us is just trying to be as flexible as possible because yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. And there's people working out right now. There's campuses like ours that are shut down, you know, and you're just going like, Hey, it is what it is. And, you know, we'll just kind of keep rolling with it. And, you know, what's tomorrow's plan? What can we accomplish tomorrow and get that accomplished? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like you said, it's out. Uh, it's like nothing you can control. It's yeah. just, it's just an unfortunate circumstances that like the world is facing and like it would be it'd be nice to have basketball back and to see college basketball back on the season but like you like you said it's it's just nothing we could control and hopefully things hopefully it does get back started November 10th hopefully we do see you guys take the court like is there anything you've been like you had mentioned zoom calls are like anyway you guys like keep in contact that way like just kind of Talk to the guys besides that, like, do you have like team meetings like every once in a while? Are you allowed to? Yeah, we have a team, you know, we have a team group chat that's something, you know, there's stuff going back and forth in there every day. Yeah. We've been doing the Zooms pretty regularly for maybe like a month and a half, maybe two months, Mm -hmm. probably two, probably two months at this point in time. Oh, wow. You know, so we've been doing one or two of those a week. Um, And then just trying to stay on top of, you know, every day I try to text or call a couple of the guys. Yeah, you know, I know the other guys on staff are doing the same thing and just stay in contact. And, you know, the other, the other hard piece for us is we have nine new guys. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's a bunch of guys. And most of them 
probably at least five, maybe six of the nine have never been on our campus. Wow. So, you know, and, and, you know, just trying to play that game of like getting to know them and let them know, Hey, here's what to expect. Because the reality is when they, whenever it is they get here, it's probably going to have to be hit the ground running. So trying to prepare them for that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It, it, that's, it's crazy. Well, at least it's good that you guys are able to do, thank God for zoom and like, yes, you know, sure. like on all that stuff to like keep in contact and build some sort of com- camaraderie with all you guys and, you for know, sure. work, work that out. But um, if you can answer this, I don't know, what, what do you think the outlook of the season will be if there is, if there is no, without the COVID, if you guys do start season? I mean, we're really excited. Like I said, I mean, we have nine new guys, so you never really know until you get, get them here. But, uh, you know, we have a couple guys that have been at the high major level. Um, another guy that was at a pretty high level transferring from UAB that was a top 150 player in the country. So, we, you know, there's some talent there. We have good freshmen coming in. We have uh, a couple junior college guys that, that played at a pretty high level at their junior colleges. So, you know, we're excited, and we've got four returning guys that all played – three that played a lot, uh, but four – all four of them played, you know, and, and three that were basically starters for at least most of the season. So, uh, you know, it looks like a good group. Again, you never know until you get them there and you see how all the pieces fit. And, all right, is that guy, you know, a four-man or a five-man? And can that guy play the point for us? And is he as good of a shooter as we thought he was? So – you know, we'll have to learn quickly on that, but we're excited. I mean, we're excited and uh, it'll be the first time it'll be all our guys, you know, it won't be guys that we inherited and, you yeah. know, we had some great ones that we did and some guys that, that really gave us everything they had, but you know, it is different. It's different when it's guys that you've recruited guys that have been recruited by you that, that, you know, for two, three years down the line, that kind of see you and are choosing to be part of that. And, yeah. You know, we're excited. I mean, we've, we've had to flip the culture. You know, we've had to get them. Uh, and I hate saying that because it sounds so cliche in yeah. this day and age. But, you know, we really did. Like, we had to get our types of guys, guys that, that you don't have to force to get in the gym, guys that you don't have to beg to get in the gym, don't have to wonder if they're getting in the gym. You know, like, I, I don't even have to call guys right now. I know. I know that they're working out. I know yeah. that they're putting in the time. Guys are, are finding way. You know, it's easy right now to come up with an excuse. Uh, the gym's closed or – you know, this, this is shut down, that's shut down. But we have a group of guys right now that are like, you know what, I found a park, you know, and I'm just going there by myself and shooting and going home. And where I'm going out and I found a hill that I can run up and down, you know, 50 times. And I do that to stay in shape. And so that's a beautiful thing when you have guys that are that motivated, self-motivated. That's amazing. And it sounds like the culture is changing there. I'm, I'm, Brian's very lucky to have you and uh, Coach Grasso, uh, like the change that culture and to help put Brian basketball on the map. Because it would be awesome to see you guys in the tournament and, you know, be a top 25 team down the line. It'd be like, it's, you know, you got to root for your, uh, your your little Rhode Island, all, sure. our, all our sports, all our teams and everything like that. So, I mean, hopefully, hopefully one of these years we can get, we can go four for four, you know, and have the four of us in the tournament. And, yeah. You know, it'll be, because yeah, that's the one thing I've learned, like, and I knew this coming up playing against Rhode Island and, you know, even just growing up and, you know, being at some of those games, like I knew that Rhode Island had a passionate basketball fan base. Yeah. But then you get up here and you really see it. And obviously the history and tradition with Providence and, and the things that they've had going on for yeah. you know, way before my lifetime. So, you know, to, to see that and to see the passion for it, uh, you know, makes me excited. It makes me want to be able to be part of something that people can really get behind. I know. I, I love it. It's, it's, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have football. So it's like, we don't have like major football around here. Like no offense to you or I or Brown, but like it'd be, you know, we don't, we don't have like Alabama or like SEC. Right. Yep. So, but like basketball has always been like the biggest thing. I saw I can remember growing up. That's all I grew up around was basketball, but it's going to be awesome. It'd be great if we could, if there was like some way to do like a Rhode Island round Robin tournament with like all you guys in it, like Brown, PC, Brian and Rhode Island, just yep. all play against each other for, like an in-season tournament or something like that. It'd be really cool to do something like that. But You know what the problem is with that? PC, those guys are the best. Yeah. Ed Cooley is one of the, the best people in college basketball. <laughs> you and I, before we got on, talked about Jeff Battle, who's yeah. one of my all-time favorite people and a true mentor and has always been that way for me. Um, 
those guys, whenever we can't get in our gym, because we don't have a practice facility, we don't have anything fancy like they do. So yeah. anytime we can't get in our gym, we call them, and they've always been accommodating. That's now, awesome. This year will probably be different with the, with the COVID stuff. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, the last two years we've, we've used that practice facility. So I keep saying that because people will be like, are you going to play PC? I'm like, we need their practice gym. And if we're playing them, they probably wouldn't let us in there. So Yeah, exactly. We'd rather just we don't keep wanna... that relationship. We can go play UConn or UMass or whoever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. PC we're playing this year. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of those. You know, yeah. Providence, we need them. They're like our big brothers. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm excited to uh, talk to Jeff, too, and after every, all the good things you said about him, too. But, He's the best. Yeah. One of the all-time – you know, I've been fortunate to come across some really great people in my life and, and most notably notably in basketball and college basketball. And he is right at the top of that list. Just a genuinely great human being. And, you know, somebody that I owe a lot to and has really helped me in so many ways, you know, in, in ways that he doesn't even know. And, you know, I can't thank him enough for that. But yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. excited when you, when you have him on. I'll be, I'll be tuned in. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, he was like I said, you and him were very quick, quick responses. Like as soon as I sent the emails out, I think you guys just running back within like the same day, um, or within like the uh, two hours, which was like I was not expecting it. And so I just appreciate you for coming on and uh, you know helping, you know, try to build this Rhode Island podcast and try to get Rhodey Sports on the map and you know focus on you guys. And I'm excited for. Brian's culture to change and more like from hearing like the changes and everything. I got to get up to a game. I hopefully you can make it up to a game. Anytime. You're always welcome. Yeah, Although, I, don't, I don't know what this year will look like, but yeah. <laughs> as long as they're letting people in the door, you are more than welcome. And I'm going to hold you to that. Thanks. Yeah. I would definitely be up there. It's not, it's a, like you said, it's easy drive 45 minutes away. That's, yeah. the, <laughs> but I appreciate you coach Martelli. I appreciate you making time for me coming on the show and um, you know, I appreciate you helping out with the roadie run back podcast and making it something big. For sure, Jeff. Anytime, anytime for you and, you know, for, for, you know, anything, like I said, we, I can't thank the people of Rhode Island that I've come across that have embraced my family, you know, and, and my children and my wife and all that, you know, it, it's been a great adjustment and it, trust me, it was not an easy one. I was nervous about it with my kids and they fought it, but um, you know, luckily we've been really lucky and my wife, Megan and, my son, Philip, my daughter, Mara, my, my little son, Nate, you know, we've grown to love it. So my son, Philip does love to be the antagonist. So he loves to, you know, sport his Sixers jersey. You know, it's dress down day at school. Uh, they go to Catholic school. So when it's dress down day at school, he loves to rock his Phillies jersey or his Eagles hat. Or He's been in a lot of uh, battles with te- with uh, classmates and teachers about, you know, Eagles and luckily we were coming coming up after the Eagles had beaten oh, okay. the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he used that to his advantage for a while and then you know, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. But hey. no, I, I am I am, you know, very grateful to the people of Rhode Island, to people like you that are, you know, just basketball guys that just love to be a part of it. And uh, you know, I'm just hoping that we can do something special with Bryant and make the, the whole state proud. Oh yeah. You guys it sounds like you guys are on your way and it sounds like uh hopefully an NCAA tournament run this year. That's the plan. I love it. I love it. Well, Coach, I appreciate your time, and we'll talk soon for sure. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Hang on. I'll just stop recording.